Christ. Everybody got your Bible? What are you looking at? What happened? You guys are looking up here like something happened. Am I under arrest? You got your Bibles? <laughs> Everybody got your Bibles? Let's see your Bibles. Come on. Say, this is my Bible. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Today I will receive the incorruptible, ever-living, never-changing, Holy Ghost powers, Word of God, and I'll be changed in Jesus' name. If you agree, shout amen. I almost forgot for a minute what I was supposed to say. So anyway, all right, ready? Go to uh, Genesis chapter 2. So what I'm going to do for the next couple of weeks is um, start talking more about Easter and things pertaining to Easter. Uh, I'm going to center my sermons around the cross, uh, about his death, burial, and resurrection. We have three weeks. Uh, on the fourth week, March 30, April 1st, we have the play, so there's a good message in there. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that we talk about the cross. So I've got a couple of sermons put together. They're not really a series. They're, we're going to come at it at several different viewpoints. Um, and this one is a sermon that I preached about eight years ago. Uh, some of you may remember, I know Frank's going to remember it. Uh, it's about the two trees. It's entitled The Two Trees. Uh, and I think it's a sermon that really sets the tone for everything, to be honest with you. It explains everything that's going on in the world today. It explains the condition of man and it explains uh, the solution for man. Praise the Lord. Should I take another offering? Because this is going to be good. All right. Huh? All right. Well, you know what? I have to get the sermon up first. Hold on. So go to Genesis chapter 2. You there yet? Good. Anybody have a joke? Because I'm not there yet. Uh, Genesis. What's my sermon called again? Two trees. All right. I got to look it up here. There it is. Two trees. Okay. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2. It's called Two Trees. Let's go to the very beginning, verse 9, <clears throat> well, verse 7, let's start in verse 7. It said, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, verse 9, it says, And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow, that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So let me, let me go over this real quick. So he made a tree. He made, uh, he, made, he made four types of trees. Number one, he made trees that were pleasant to the sight. Those are for women. Arr. I'm not funny today, am I? Not at all. All right. And, and, I guess, and good for food. Those are for men. Okay, <laughs> then the tree of life, and also in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So notice there were four types of trees, while the two were specific trees. The, the last two were specific trees, but the first two were types of trees. So the first one was uh, trees that looked good, okay, like flowery trees, right? You know, roses that women like, uh, what else do you guys want to eat? I don't, chocolates? I thought you said chocolates. <laughs> Chocolate trees. Uh, yeah. So these are trees that were good, nice to look at. They were beautiful trees he made. Then he made trees that were good for food. Okay, they grew ribeye, porterhouse, <laughs> filet mignon. You know, that's what they grew. They grew stuff for us guys, good for food. And then the two more trees, it says there was a tree of life, and then there was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Can everybody see that? Four types or four specific trees. Trees to look at, trees to eat from, a tree of life, and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So my sermon is two trees. So I talked about four, two trees. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by the time we're done here. Okay, so there's four trees that were specific. Everybody good? All right, let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Let's lay some groundwork here so you can see where we're going. Verse 1, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, 
Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tr fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it nor touch it, lest you die. Okay, everybody good so far? All right. So let me ask you a question. Let's really dig into this. Who is Satan talking to? This is not a joke or a trick. Eve, correct? So when God spoke to Adam and told him not to eat the trees, was Eve there? No. All right, did we miss that? We missed that scripture, right? Let's go back. Let's go back to Genesis uh, 2.15. Genesis 2.15, I want you to see this. He says, Then the Lord God took the man, the man, not the woman, the man, put him in the garden and, and of Eden to tend and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Everybody see that? All right. Now it's not till verse 21, 22, 23, 24 that Eve is created. So who did God say you can't eat of it? It was Adam. So I want you to notice where Satan goes. He goes to the person who has secondhand information. He attacks the person who has secondhand information. If he would have attacked Adam, Adam would have said what? No, it is written. I shall not eat from that tree, God said. But notice he goes to the woman who's got secondhand information. In other words, Adam told her, uh, Eve, we can't eat from this tree. You know, let me give you a tour of the garden. <laughs> right? Let me show you around a little bit. I'll show you our room, you know, and things like that. And, you know, and she's like, all right, great. Where's the vanity? You know, where can I do my makeup? Where do I put my shoes? <laughs> anyway, so he's, you know, he gives her a tour and he tells her, okay, here's this tree that we're not allowed to eat of it. But notice how Satan throws the curveball. He says, he says, did God really say don't eat of it? And she says, well, he said don't eat it and touch it. There's a mistake there. God never said don't touch it. He said don't eat it. Actually, God said touch it when he said take care of it. Back in chapter 2, he tells Adam, he says, I want you to tend to all the trees. In other words, to prune them, to touch them, to make sure they're good, you know, keep them healthy. They're your trees. You need to prune them. You need to water them, to fertilize them. So you're supposed to touch it. You have to touch it to do that. But notice she throws in something because she had secondhand information. Let me tell you what I mean. Let, let me just throw a little, a little extra here. When, when, when something happens in your life, don't ever say this, well, Joel Osteen said, or well, Pastor Artie said, Notice Jesus never quoted, like, well, Isaiah said. No, Jesus said, it is written. In other words, you need to have firsthand knowledge of the word for yourself. Don't go by what I say. Go by what the Bible says. My job is to point you there. Well, Pastor Arnie says that. If somebody does this to me, then I can do it right back to them. No, I never said that. So she had secondhand knowledge, which just ruined things for, you know, it ruined the world. But anyway, so let's continue. Watch this. So back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the tree of the, uh, the gardens, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden you shall not eat. Okay, verse 4. And the serpent said, You shall not die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what, no, spitting like crazy. So what's the biggest problem we have with this statement? Notice he says, if you eat of it, you will be like God. So God is holding something back from you. In other words, God is holding information back from you, Eve, because he knows that the moment you eat of it, you'll be like him. How many of you remember in the book uh, in Isaiah, or why Satan became Satan, is because he wanted to be like him. Remember in that book of Isaiah, Satan says, well, I would be like the most, well, Lucifer, remember, he was Lucifer first. He was a beautiful angel. 
And he says, well, I will want to be like God. I will be like the Most High God. I will sit in God's throne. I will rule and reign over things. And he goes, yeah, I this and I that. And God said, I, 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 boom, you're out of here. And the Bible says, Jesus said that like lightning, I saw Satan cast out of heaven and hit the ground. So in other words, the moment he thought he was better than God or like God, God went, boom, you're out of here. He says, don't even think like that in my presence. There is no one like my God. Remember, we have something called pride, right? Pride comes before the fall. Well, that's what he did. And he was about to not only just fall, but he got knocked out of heaven like lightning. So now what he's doing is he's telling Eve, no, God doesn't want you to be like him. It's the same sin that he was guilty of. You see, he's imparting her, his sin on her. Now watch this. Here's where it gets really interesting. When God created Adam and Eve in Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, he says this. He says, then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion to rule and reign and multiply over all the earth, right? In other words, God already made them to be just like him. In other words, they were as close to being God without being God. And he says, now Satan says, no, he just doesn't want you to be like him. She should have said, I already am. See, let me, let me just, I'm going to just throw a lot of extra stuff in this, because I've preached this several times, yeah, well, last time was eight years ago, I've preached this several times, but I want to throw some extra stuff in here. If you're a born-again Christian, if, you're, if your heart is for God, don't ever let the devil put you down and tell you who you're not. Because Jesus said, you are the apple of his eye. You are more than a conqueror. You're above and not beneath. He died. He went to the lowest parts of the universe to elevate us to the highest parts. We are risen with Christ. We are raised with him. We are seated with him. We're alive with him. And, and 1 John chapter 4 says, as he is, so are we in this world. So for anybody to degrade you, to put you down and tell you you're less of, of what you're supposed to be, that God made you, you need to slap them across your face. Say, how dare you talk to me like that? Do you know who I am? I'm a child of the Most High God. God gave me the power to be a son and daughter of God. When I accepted Christ, I accepted his life, his spirit. I was born again of incorruptible seed. I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Oh, you're not amening me enough. This is good. I'm going to give that a kick. This is my lip. There we go. All right. Just had to get it out of my system. So watch this. Watch this. Ready? He says this. Now the serpent said to the woman, you shall be, but you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Ready? So the word knowing good and evil, here, here is what everything comes down to. Here's what everything comes down to. The word knowing good and evil in Hebrew is the word to designate or it's the word to decide. Let, let me put it, let me say it a little bit differently. So when he says that God knows that you will know good and evil, he wasn't saying, Satan wasn't saying, you'll know the difference what's good and what's evil. He wasn't saying you'll know the difference. He's saying, you can now decide what is good and what is evil. What is the ultimate thing about God? He makes the rules. He decides what's good and evil. He decides what's right and wrong. But what he said to Eve is, you will now be able to decide. You'll be the judge and the jury. Don't tell, let God tell you what to do. Don't let God tell you what's right and what's wrong. The moment you eat from that tree, you'll be able to decide what is right for your life 
or what is wrong for your life. You'll be able to be the God of your own world. Isn't it true today that what we Christians, or what the Bible holds true of what's right and wrong, the world tells us we're old-fashioned, or, oh, you're just a right-winger. Or you're one of those. Well, it's relative. What's right for you is not wrong for me. Isn't that what it's all come down to? We get to decide what's right for us and what's wrong for us. But God made it clear. This is what you can do, and this is what you can't do. This is my world. I made it. I made you. You live by my rules, or you're out of here. And isn't it funny that we just keep throwing stuff at God, say, no, God didn't say that. Oh, God didn't really mean it that way. Oh, it's okay to murder your unborn baby out of convenience because I really didn't want the child anyway. Who wants to bring an unwanted child into this world? God, you know, God's okay with that. The world makes their own rules. The world does not want to listen to what God says is right and what's wrong. They don't want absolutes. This is what it's all come down to. He put this carrot out in front of her and said, listen, Eve, you can decide what's right and wrong. Don't let that old, bearded, white-haired guy tell you what to do. You tell me that's not the condition of man today, or it has been forever. Why is it okay for extremists to cut the heads off of people? Because they say it's okay? Why is it okay to live with somebody before you're married? Test drive? I, it's the truth. Well, we need to see if we can get along. I had one lady argue with me. She goes, well, and she's a churchgoer. No. <laughs> you, ever hear, you ever hear that term, whoever denied it, supplied it? <laughs> So this one lady church go argue with me, and, she, and you know, I said, you're going to go live with that guy? Oh, yeah. I said, why? Well, it's cheaper for us to live together than to live apart. Are you getting married? Well, we don't think so. We're just going to live together because it's cheaper. I said, how do you think God feels about that? Oh, I think he's okay because we're being smart with our money. <laughs> so it's when we begin to decide the rules for our lives, and we put this aside. That decision, and don't tell me it doesn't happen today, because it happens even today as a Christian, right? We have Christians that it's okay to say, you know, four-letter words and have a potty mouth and say, think it's okay to, well, God still loves me. Yes, I know he still loves you. Duh. But it's not okay. It's not okay to look at other women. The Bible says, Jesus said it. He goes, listen, guys, you're playing games. Don't play games with me. He said, if you lust in your heart, you've already committed the sin. Well, I never touched her. And he says, you're missing the point. And so as Christians, we, what do we do? 
We justify. It's, you know, well, it's a, it's a gray area. We've messed ourselves up. Even, even Christians have made our own rules. I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. No, you don't. But then why did Jesus make the church? Why did he make pastors and prophets and evangelists and apostles? Why? Why did he say bring your tithe to the storehouse so they could be meat? I guess Jesus just kind of, you know, said, well, that's okay, guys. Just stay home on Sunday morning. I get you. Yeah, the world is different. You can get on Facebook Live and watch church. That's good. You think, can you imagine Jesus getting up to preach? He had no worship team. He didn't have a microphone. He didn't have a sound system speakers. He didn't have words on the screen. <laughs> he just sat and he preached for hours. Paul preached for so long that the guy fell asleep in a window and fell out and dropped dead. No, I'm serious. And what did Paul do? He raised him from the dead. He says, come back here. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I'm still preaching. How dare you get up and leave? How dare you die on me? I got a sermon. I still didn't do my altar call. I got to take up an offering. Get back here. No, we've got to make everything right. You know, we got to make church the way church, we think church should be. And, and I don't, this is fine. I don't mind this. You know, we're not making fun of it. But we're saying we have to, we have to watch that fine line when we begin to make our own rules. Because it goes back to the tree. It's all about the tree. Have you ever heard the term that uh, uh, one man's treasure, uh, trash is another man's treasure? Right? That's why we have tag sales. Because what I think is junk, someone else thinks it's a treasure. So what I think is bad, they think is good. In other words, I, I'm designating that as garbage, but somebody else can come along and designate it as good. Look at the world. Some people say Trump is the greatest president ever lived. Other people hate his guts, can't wait to go. How is it, listen, how is it that two people can have two different opinions of the same person? Because they're deciding who is good and who is evil. Because it goes back to the tree. It's either it's good or it's either it's evil. It can't be both. Am I making sense? And so that's why we're in this condition we are today. That's why the world is a mess. Verse 6. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and was pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he ate, who was with her. Where was Adam when she ate? Right there with her. He was right next to her. What does that mean? He was blinded by love. You didn't get that. Satan is talking to your wife, and you don't stop it? And the eyes of both them were opened, and they were, knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves and everything. Verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? The Hebrew says this, says, why are you where you're at? That's what the Hebrew says. He didn't say, where are you? God knows everything. He's not dumb. He, did, he wasn't looking for them and couldn't find them. You know, he's got find my iPhone. He knew, I see you. <laughs> he knew exactly where they were. But he said this, he says, why are you in the condition that you're in? How I many of you have dogs or cats? And your dog takes, you know, a poop and, you, you know, and, and, and as soon as you walk in a room, the ears flop, the tails, you know, like this. And, you know, you're, woo, woo. what do you say? And you smell it, you see it. What do you say to the dog? What did you do? You know exactly what he did. I mean, the whole room is 
filled with an odor. What did you do? That's what God was saying. What did you do? Why did you do that? And then he lines them up. Adam, she did it. <laughs> Eve, his fault. Devil, I did it. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know how he is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. What are you going to do about it, God? I did it. <laughs> so then God, God starts with the man. He started with the man. I put you in charge. What did, she, what did he, so then what does God do? Then he works, starts with her. Okay, because you did this, Satan. He says, you will crawl on the ground on dust for the rest of your life. Then he goes to Eve, because you did this, Eve, because you will be, you'll have child pains and birth and things like that. And he goes, Adam, because you did this, because you think you're God of your world, get out. And now you'll have to work. You make your own rules. You live by your own rules. You're not living under my blessing anymore. You think you're God? Go try it out. I've said this for many years. I said, a woman got us in this mess, but then a woman got us out, Mary. Oh, come on, ladies. Yay, man. <laughs> Woohoo! Women's live. <laughs> Listen, when he talked to Mary, he said this. Look at Genesis 3. Look at this. You're missing something. Genesis 3, verse uh, 15, I think it is. Uh, oh, 16, and to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and, and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children, and your desire uh, shall be your, for your husband, and you sh he shall rule over you. I, I miss 15, it's in 15. So to the devil he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Women don't have seeds, they have eggs. So what is he saying? He said, okay, listen, a woman... Satan, you got a woman to mess things up, but I'm going to raise a woman that's going to change the everything. And her seed. And he's like, wait a minute, women don't have seeds? That's right. Gotcha. Watch what I'm going to do. But ready? Let me change things. A tree got us in this mess. And 4,000 years later, Another tree got us out. So let me tell you this whole, well, let, well, let me give you some scriptures. Uh, Galatians chapter 3 said that Jesus, that everyone, that, that Jesus became a curse for us and cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. The Bible says that Jesus hung on a Tree. Well, let me ask you this. What is a cross made of? Wood. Where does wood come from? Trees. Jesus hung on a tree. So listen, this whole thing is about two trees. It's the story of two trees. The tree that made us think we're God and the tree that made us submit to God. The tree that took our life and the tree that gave back our life. The first tree, let me give you some comparisons of the two trees. Ready? Number one, the first tree was inviting and pleasing to the eye. Everybody hates the second tree. Do you realize what the world has done to the second tree today? It's jewelry. It's become nothing but jewelry. Why? Well, that's how the world makes it look better. It's not gold and silver. The cross is a tree. 
Number two, God forbid us to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God can't wait for us to take a bite of this tree. He says, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. Number three, Satan will always take us. Every moment of your life, Satan is pulling you to the first tree. Don't listen to God. You make your own mind up. Don't listen to him. His rules, no, no, no. His Ten Commandments, no, no, no. Your, your mother's, no, no. He's always pulling us there. And God is always p- grabbing us back and saying, no, no. Get back to this tree. Pick up your cross and follow me. Number four, the first tree banished us from paradise. The second tree opened the doors to paradise. Number five, and you can bring the kids in, I'm about to get done. The first tree took us away from the tree of life. The second tree is the tree of life. It all comes down to two trees. Which tree will you bite from? Listen, you ever hear the term, you are what you eat? Yes? Well, we ate from the first tree, and we became that tree. But when we come to the second tree, we become that tree. Amen? The importance of the cross. It's not just something we hang up. It's not something we put on top of buildings. It's not something we wear around our necks. It's not even something we tattoo on our shoulders. That tree gave us life. That tree destroyed the first tree. I'm going to read a scripture because we're going to receive communion. But I had this in my notes, but I want to read it. It's in John chapter 6, verse 53. It says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, it's what we're going to do, he says, You have no life in you. This is the tree. This is all part of the second tree. He hung on there. His blood poured down the sides of the, of the wood, the cross. His flesh. There were, listen, when they put Jesus on the tree, it had splinters. They didn't shave it, make it nice for, oh Jesus, we just want to make you comfortable. No, they rammed him on there, nailed him to it, and that thing was as as raw as raw could be. And can you imagine, after being whipped 39 times, and your flesh is wide open, and now you're laying up against a tree, and now you've got splinters going right into your flesh. He was nailed between his two feet like this, and so he he, he would hang down to give his feet some rest. And then he would push up so he can breathe. And every time he did that, his back, wide open wound, rubbed against the splinters. His flesh and his blood was on that tree. And Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he said, you have no part with me. You see, that's the antidote for the first tree. He says, whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. And the Bible says, as soon as he did that, everybody turned and walked away, except for the disciples. 
Think about how many people have walked away from Christ when all he was doing is giving us the cure. He said, here, here's the vaccination. Here's the pill. Here's the cure to sin, to sickness, to unforgiveness, to hate. Here's the cure. And what do we do? No, thanks. Not interested. I need to make my own rules. And listen, even Christians play with that today. Well, I'm a little in and I'm a little out. We're going to receive communion. And so I hope you do this with a little different understanding. We're going to eat of the second tree right now. That gives us life. 